Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Ewan. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for the Alumni Career Development Webinar Series featuring Diane DeResta. The webinar series covers a range of career topics and includes speakers from a variety of backgrounds. The series is co-sponsored by the TC Office of Career Services and the Office of Alumni Relations. Videos of past webinars are available on our website at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. Today, alumna Diana DeResta presents knockout presentations, Be Clear, Concise, and Confident. Diane is the founder and CEO of Duresta Communications, a New York City consultancy serving business leaders who deliver high stakes presentations, whether one to one, in front of a crowd, or from an electronic platform. Duresta is the author of Knockout Presentations How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz, an Amazon.com category bestseller, and has spoken on four continents. Diane is the past president of the New York City chapter of the National Speakers Association and the former media trainer for the NBA and WNBA. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any issues with the audio, please feel free to chat me directly in the chat box. And without further ado, here's Diane DeResta. <laughs> I am really excited to be here at this TC webinar as a graduate of Teachers College and in, in the area of speech pathology. And before we get into the meet and before I tell you a little bit more about myself, I'd love to get to know all of you and who, who's on the line. So I'd like to do a quick poll. And of course, my, my slide is sticking. Here we go. And here's what I'd love to know. Where are you in terms of your career? Are you a student? Maybe you've been in the workplace for one to four years, or maybe five to 10 or five to nine. There might be people here who have 10 plus years, or you could be a retiree. And I realize there are other categories like between jobs, but if you fit into one of these categories, will you use the polling right now? And Alyssa, I'm going to open that up for you to do and I'm looking at the numbers coming in right now and it's still moving but it looks like the majority is at the 10 plus years which is great because what that means is you realize the importance of presentations in your life even though you are seasoned and you've been out there for a while so according to the poll it looks like 42% have been in the workplace for more than 10 years. 23% uh, of you are students. 4% are recent grad, grads, congratulations. Uh, and it looks like 19% five to nine years, 14% one to four. So most of you are out there a while. And what I'm here to say is whether or not you are a recent grad or a seasoned professional, presentation skills are key to your success. And so before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. And again, I will tell you that my, here it's sticking. All right, so the, a few fun facts about me. Alyssa already told you that I'm a past president of the National Speakers Association New York chapter. I am the author of Knockout Presentations. And what I'm really excited about is this book is now in its third edition. It was launched in September for the third edition, but it's been selling all these years. I have a new publisher called Morgan James, so I'm excited about that. And I'm also a recipient of the Golden Mike Award in terms of speaking. Now in 2015, that was a key year for me because I earned the CSP. That stands for Certified Speaking Professional. And it's a designation given to fewer than 20% of speakers worldwide. So I was really honored to receive that. And 
just so you know, I'm not just local, even though I'm based in New York City, I've spoken on four continents and love the experience. On a personal note, I am from a military family. My father was in the Army, my sister was in the Air Force, and that means I went to eight different elementary schools. So I've had to learn flexibility and the ability to communicate with all different kinds of people and cultures. And most importantly, I am married, but I'm not going to tell you how many years. And I am a big dark chocolate lover. So I am looking forward to tomorrow for Valentine's Day. So with that, I want to talk about the importance of speaking, because what I tell, tell audiences now is that speaking is the new competitive advantage. You can no longer be without this skill. And it really is a testament to that to see so many people who have 10 years or more experience on this webinar. Here's what's different. Years ago, a senior manager could delegate speaking to a junior leader. Today, the market wants to hear from you. And one of the things that's different is there's so much competition out there. So the ability to be heard above the noise is harder and harder. And that's why you need to have these skills of speaking and presenting. In addition to that, things are now commoditized. And that means that even if you are an entrepreneur and you have created a new software product, it's just a matter of time before someone else can duplicate it. So what helps you stand out among the pack, uh, pack or the crowd is your presentation. So really important to be able to use these skills. Now let's talk about that because what's different too is there's not as much hierarchy in the workplace. And so you may have to influence people who don't report directly to you. And so let's talk a bit, a bit about dynamic influence. At the very simplest level, when you give a message, you have your content and you have your delivery or your performance. Now on the upper right hand side of this graph is the person who's got great delivery. You've seen this person. He or she loves the spotlight. They're funny. They're dynamic. They're very confident. But then after their entertaining presentation, you leave the room and you say, what did I learn? Not much. And we call that person the showman. High on sizzle, very low on steak. Now the opposite is the person who does have the content. These are your subject matter experts. But they can't deliver the goods. And so that's called a lost opportunity. And you may be getting a picture in your mind right now of some of these people. As an executive speech coach, this is where I spend a lot of my time working with very smart, technical, subject matter experts, but for some reason they can't get their message across. The worst place on this grid is the bottom right-hand corner because these are people who are low on content, low on performance, and that's a somnambulant audience. You can throw away the ambient, just trot this guy out because he's going to put you right to sleep. But where content and performance intersect, that is dynamic influence. So we're going to be breaking this down in terms of delivery skills and messaging and how you can up your game because it's so important today to be able to do that. So where are we going? Let me give you the agenda or the roadmap for this webinar. We're going to talk about how to align the visual, vocal, and verbal communication because one of the definitions of executive presence is people who can give off a consistent, congruent message. So the body language, the tone of voice, and the words are all saying the same thing. Secondly, we're going to talk about how to create a clear outcome for your message. In other words, give you laser-like focus instantaneously. And then we'll talk about how to recover with grace because you can have all the great skills in the world, a perfect message, but if something goes wrong and you don't know how to recover, that can detract from your reputation. So with that, I thought it would be fun to start with a brain teaser. So here it is. How is public speaking like a yam? How is public speaking like a yam? Now, if we were live in the same room face to face, I would ask you for your answers. But given that this is a webinar, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's actually 
a formula for everything that you need to know about speaking. Isn't that great? It's really simple. Here it is. Know yourself. Know your audience. Know your message. Y-A-M. And everything we talk about and everything that you need to know falls into one of those buckets. So know yourself in terms of you being a package of skills, what is your style, what is your personal brand, and then stay true to that so that you can be authentic. Secondly, who is your audience? And that may change from time to time, but how are they wired and how do they want to receive information? That's key. And then finally, know your message. What are the three key points that you want to get across and then know them cold? And here I know is what everybody is thinking. Well, that's great, Diane, but how do I control my nervousness? I probably don't have to take a poll to ask how many people get nervous before a presentation. We've all heard that it's the number one fear. And you know what? It doesn't have to be. Nervousness is just energy. So let's talk a minute about this because this is the elephant in the room. It's, all right, what do I do? How do I control this? The first step is to identify where you are on your confidence level. Now, in my book, Knockout Presentations, I have a public speaking quotient, and it's a quiz. But today, I'm not going to give you a quiz. I'm going to ask you off the top of your head how you would rate yourself. So let me explain these categories before we go into a poll. The first is confident. If you're basically confident, that means that you are comfortable speaking in front of a group, you prepare, you know what to do, you can, you can do it. Butterflies, this is where you start to get anxious before and you can feel that quivering in your stomach or maybe you're talking really fast or your heart is beating. The next level is panic. This is someone who's really afraid of speaking, may think about it weeks, maybe a month ahead of time and is really sweating about it. And then there's phobic, and that's the person who will avoid it at all costs, will change jobs so they don't have to speak. There are remedies for all of those, but first, where would you say you fall in these categories? So would you now look at the poll and rate yourself? Are you confident? Do you have butterflies? Are you in panic mode? Or are you phobic when it comes to public speaking? So I'm watching the numbers come through and I predicted this and it seems to be showing that the vast majority feel butterflies. So 16% of you are confident. Bravo. 19% panic, yeah, I, it's, you're, it's not unusual, and 62% or 60% so far feel those butterflies, and that's not even with 100% of people voting. So if we look at those numbers, we know that it's normal to feel a little bit of anxiety because what that is is your adrenaline. So we do have butterflies, but the key is how do you make those butterflies fly in formation because the adrenaline that you have is actually a good thing. It's helping you prepare to be dynamic. But what you don't want is for it to work against you, and that's what nervousness is. So there's no judgment. It's just energy. But how are you using the energy? Is it backing up against you and making you nervous, or are you using it for dynamic performance? So here's one thing that you can do. It goes to the breath. I'm going to take you through a breathing exercise that will help you center so that you can calm down the racing heart, so that you can slow down and catch your breath and collect your thoughts. What you need to remember is the number four. This exercise is called the ha breath. And what you do here is you inhale through the nose to the count of four, you hold the breath to the count of four, you exhale through the mouth to the count of four, and then you hold the breath again for four beats. So I'm going to take you through this, and I'd like you all to do this with me. Ready? Inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, 
one, two, three, four. So it's very easy to remember. Inhale four, hold four. Exhale four, hold again for four. Now here's what's the beauty of this. Not only is it simple to implement and remember, but you can do this in your seat. Let's say you're the next person to present. You can be doing this and nobody will know you're doing it. And what it does is it brings you into the present moment. Why is that important? Because I know if you're nervous, you're living in the future and you're thinking of everything that can go wrong. Oh, I hope I don't trip. I hope I don't get brain freeze. However, the breath brings you back to the present moment. So in addition to breathing techniques, I also have an ebook called Give Fear the Finger, How to Knock Out Fear of Public Speaking. And in that ebook, there are four categories for remedying, if that's such a word, your nervousness. There are physical, mental, behavioral, and chemical remedies for managing your nerves. But at the very least, always come back to the breath and there are also some really good apps that you can use for meditation and right before you go into the room take a moment two minutes and meditate and get into a calming state because it really is about presence now here's the question I ask every audience when you walk into a room do you own the room or does the room own you because what is key is how do you create presence on the platform? And I will tell you that a lot of times people don't understand what that is. But we all know when we see someone who knows how to hold the space, who knows how to create that kind of air or presence about them, you feel it. It's palpable. And I'm going to break that down for you. One of the mistakes people make is they forget that their presentation begins the moment they walk into the room. It's not when you say your first words. And we've seen studies where first impressions take about seven seconds or less. So you have communicated the moment you walk in. And so I want to talk about the walk on and the walk off because they are really important pieces of your presentation. And I don't hear a lot of talk about it. Your entrance and your exit can make or break your presentation. Now, let me tell you the story about John. This was a client of mine, and it wasn't his real name, John, but I'm calling him John. He was a lawyer in a corporation, and I was asked to, to work with him on his presentation. And I said to him, John, before you begin your presentation, let's start with your walk-on. And this is what he looked like, forlorn head down, shoulders forward, eyes on the floor. And I turned to him and I said, John, you're walking in with the body language of defeat. It's over before you ever open your mouth. And when you talk about influence, you need to look like you're confident, even if you don't feel that way. So what I want to do for you today is break down presence in terms of the walk on and the walk off. So let's start with the walk on. Now, normally when I'm in front of a live audience, I pull people up and we demonstrate and coach them. But I'm going to take you through this verbally. The first step is to walk into the center of the room, pivot and face the audience. Do not walk and talk at the same time. This is all done in silence. Now that you're facing the audience, connect with your eyes and the way you do that is by looking at two different people maybe one on each side of the room again all in silence now you say your opening line and you pause and then you say your next line so let me put this into practice if I walked into the room turned faced the audience connected with two people I would then say good morning my name is Diane DeResta. Did you hear that pause? Very often when I coach people, you'll hear something like this. Good morning, my name is. No, it is not one sentence, it is two. So you can practice this right after the call. Good morning, my name is. 
this seems like a little thing, but it, it has tremendous impact. So now what you have is an exchange of energy. You always have an exchange of energy between a speaker and a listener. But if you're talking and walking and you're talking at them, that doesn't happen. Now, the second thing to know is that silence is your best friend. If I asked people, how many of you are afraid of silence? I think most hands would go up. People are. But think of it this way. The person who masters silence is the one who's in the better position, the power position. They're the better negotiator, the better poker player, the better salesperson, the better interviewer. Silence is your best friend. Now let's talk about the walk-off. Because you can do a knockout job and lose credibility because of how you end your presentation. So the way that you do a smooth walk-off is you say your ending line and you do that by maintaining eye contact and you pause. Now, if there's any kind of applause, then you hold it. Because I've seen when people rush off, you communicate two things non-verbally. Number one, I'm nervous and I can't wait to get off here. And number two, you're rejecting their gift. Their applause is a gift. So wait till it dies down. Look forward. Put your shoulders back, head up, eyes forward, and walk off. It's not over until you sit in your seat. So again, when you are walking off, you want to say your last line to an individual. Choose one person in the audience and say that entire line to them while maintaining eye contact and then pause for a moment. If they applaud, great. If they don't, if it's not appropriate, no problem. But the key is stand up straight, look forward, eyes center, head up. Because you don't want to be rolling your eyes, and I've seen this so many times, people finish and they give off these nonverbal signals, and you've just killed what you did before. Or no smirking, and I've seen this too. People make faces, and you can tell what they're really communicating is, thank God that's over. No, you want to hold it until you sit in your seat. That is key, and it is the little things that make the greatest impact. And I will tell you this, that there's probably nobody here who has to do an entire makeover. What you need to do are these little tweaks, and the more you use these tweaks, the greater the impact. You will go higher in your presentation. So do little things at a time, and don't discount the importance of the walk-on and the walk-off. So here's what I'd like to know next from everybody. When it comes to your presentations, how do you show up? In other words, where are you spending most of your time? Is it meetings? Is it panels? Is it the phone? Are you on a stage a lot? Do you do mostly webinars? In other words, if you you, you may do all of these, but where do you spend most of your time? That's what I would like to find out. So would you now, in the poll, choose the one where you present most of the time? And wow. <laughs> At first it said 100% meetings, 79, panels, phone, stage. Okay, 19%. It's still coming in. But it's looking like most people spend their time in meetings, and I am not surprised at that at all. So we have 67% who have voted so far. I'm going to give it a few more seconds to see if there's anyone else who wants to weigh in. I don't think it's going to change overall. The surprise to me is that stage presentations is higher than phone. I would have thought phone because there's so many teleconferences. But the biggest one, of course, is meetings, and that is exactly what I expected. The key here is to know where you're spending most of your time and to know how to show up. So in meetings, you may either be doing stand up or sit down. There are some differences, but we will talk about the skills next. And they apply to all of these situations. But the first question is, and I will get to this as soon as we get, here we go. 
when you enter a room, if you are face to face, this is not necessarily phone, but if you are seeing the person, then you are showing up in three ways. They're seeing your body language, they're hearing your tone in your voice, and they're hearing your words. My question to you is, which will people believe first? Would it be the body language? Would it be the voice? Or would it be the words? Would you now vote? Which are people going to believe first? What do you think has the most impact? The body language, the tone of voice, or the words? So we're going to wait for that to come in. And we're still in progress, so I want to give people enough time to, to vote. Okay, so half of you have voted so far, so I want to give you a little bit more time. And then I'll, I will share the results. And I will share that in a study. All right, so we have... 67% of you voting, 69, and you know, it's not really changing the results that much, so I'm going to give it three seconds, and what most of you said, 97% of you said it was the body language. Well, let's find out if you are correct, because there was a study by a professor in UCLA and he was studying the likability of communication. In other words, he watched people in one-to-one -one communication, and he was studying how likable they were when they communicated. And he was actually able to quantify these three levels, the visual, the vocal, and the verbal. And so here's what this one study showed. The body language was 55% of the message, the tone of voice was 38%, and your words were only 7%. What does that tell you about communication? <laughs> I usually joke and say, it doesn't matter what you say as long as you look good up there. And for the people in the audience, especially the women, it's scientific research for you to invest in a, a wardrobe. But actually, it's not the case. Do not take this literally, because obviously, if I were talking in front of the group or you were talking in front of the group and we didn't have any words, you'd lose all the message. What this says to me, and the reason I keep using this study, is when you are nervous or you're unprepared and one of these goes out of sync, then body language becomes the default. And that means that people will discount what they hear in order to believe what they see. Literally, they will discount what you say in order to believe what they see. So you can understand why that walk-on is so important, why that walk-off can negate what just went before. You need to show up in a way that's congruent. And I get a lot of requests to work with leaders on executive presence. And often, one of these is out of alignment, and we put them back together so that they are giving a seamless message, because that's what builds trust and credibility. Now, let's talk about what gets in the way. I'm going to do this quickly, just touch on a few of these. But in terms of the visual detractors, a weak handshake. People don't know that that is a presentation. It is. Posture is key. Just as we told the story of John, you want your shoulders back. You don't want to tilt your head. You want to look forward, and you want to be standing up straight, not bobbing and weaving. The same thing is true when you're seated at a table. And when it comes to gestures, your power space is from your waist to your face. What that means is, if you look at where we've cut him off, his hands should be above the waist because that will denote confidence. Gestures are a good thing. You want to use them in a, an effective way to show expression. You don't want to be in perpetual motion. And you want to consider the venue and the culture. In some cultures, they use fewer gestures than others. That relates to image. You want to think about what you're wearing and how you're put together because your attire is a visual shorthand. So even if you're on a factory floor in a very non-corporate environment, if you're the speaker that day, if you're running a meeting, dress one notch higher and be sure to check yourself 
in a mirror. You know, we all come in sometimes from the cold and we've got static electricity or maybe you had a poppy seed bagel for breakfast and it's stuck in your teeth. Check yourself out in terms of your image. And then the most important thing is eye contact. Now the mistake people make is they make contact but they don't know how to make an eye connection. So this is where we take good to great. A person who makes an eye connection will sustain the eye contact. So for example, you go into a room, you break it into quadrants, and you find one face, a friendly face, and you talk just to that person for a sentence or two. Then you find another person and you talk only to that pair of eyes, nobody else. And again, it's for a sentence or two. Now you go to another section of the room and do the same thing. How long is that? About three to five seconds. And then you find a friendly face on the other side. And what this does is it creates a balance so people feel like you're including everybody instead of talking just to the center of the room. More importantly, it gives you a connection. Think about one-to-one. -one. Your eyes are not scattered. You're sustaining that connection with people. You can do that in a room, at a meeting, or in a large group in the same way. It is a powerful technique. Now, the other thing to think of is your vocal. Now, when it comes to vocal communication, there are some mistakes that people make. And I'll go through these quickly as well. Non-words. These are your fillers. Um, uh, like, you know, okay, basically. It's a habit and we often don't hear ourselves. So step one is record yourself and start to hear how often you do it. Secondly, the more prepared you are, the fewer ums you'll have. And the more you pause and practice, the fewer ums you're going to have. But it takes practice. Weak projection will not help anyone. If I speak like this the whole time, the image is that I'm timid and I'm soon going to be overlooked. People who are effective communicators project their voice. Now, if you're in a small group, you may be using your conversational voice. But if it's a larger room, you want to project to the back wall. So you need to change depending on the venue. A bigger mistake is speaking too fast. I'm from the New York area. I know I speak quickly, but here's what you can do. You can use the pause. And by speaking quickly but putting a stop where you would have a comma or a period is going to help the message land. So really important is to master the pause if you master nothing else. Again, silence is your best friend. I can't emphasize it enough. People who are staccato, who speak quickly, are perceived as nervous. People who pause are perceived as confident. I'm not going to go into monotone because I think we can have 100% agreement that monotone is deadly. If you tend to have a flat voice, there are a couple of things you can do. Get louder. As you get louder, your pitch will go up. You can also highlight key words in your notes and then emphasize those key words. Here's the way that you totally get rid of monotone. Ready? Get excited! <laughs> if you're not excited about your message, message, who is going to be? Now, you may say, Diane, I have a technical, boring topic. And to you, I say, there's no such thing as a boring topic, only boring speakers. Now, yes, if you have a lot of numbers, it can get tedious. But built in stories, built in metaphors, built in analogies, there are ways that you can punch it up. If you are of a certain generation, you probably have some uptalk. Uptalk is a rising inflection. It sounds like you're asking a question, but you're really making a statement. I will tell you this, that uptalk will not serve you in the workplace. I don't hear it in executives, but I do hear it in other places, and it is pervasive. So we all need to guard against this. To sound authoritative, make sure your voice comes down at the end of a sentence. So Repeat after me. Even though I can't hear you, you can do this at your computer. Ready? Today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. Do you hear the difference? That simple downward inflection makes you sound authoritative. And then finally, don't be a talking head where you memorize a script. Have your key messages and then talk to that. That will make you sound like an expert.
Now, when it comes to your words, are you wimping out with wimpy words or weak speak? It sounds like this. So if you don't mind, I'd like to set up a meeting because this is sort of a good idea. And I hope you can come because now this is only an idea, but and what have you said? If your aim is to influence, persuade, convince, it's not happening. So when your intention is influence and persuasion, use power words. So it's not if, it's when or by. Get rid of sort of or kind of. It is, definitely. Eliminate hope. I'm confident. It's only, it's just, it modifies, say it is. I once had an intern and I introduced him to my husband and he said, well, I'm just an intern. I said, no, you're not just an intern, you're an intern, you have value. Suggest and recommend are different because suggest means here's one of many options. Recommend says, I'm putting my conviction behind this. And again, perhaps is a weaker word. So start to tune in. Do you pepper your conversation with wimpy words? Think about your intent. Are you in a conflict? By all means, soften your language. Do you want to influence and convince? Use stronger language. Now let's go to audience, which is the second part of the YAM formula. Whether you realize it or not, every audience is thinking three things. It may be subliminal, but they're thinking it anyway. The first question in their mind is, who are you? Are you friend or foe? Are you likable? Can I trust you? The second question they're thinking is, who are you to tell me? In other words, what are your credentials and how have you earned the right to be speaking here today? The third question, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? All right. You're likable, you're credible, but why should I stay for 20 to 60 minutes? What value will you bring? So knowing that an audience is thinking this, even if they're not aware if they're thinking it, the sooner you can answer these questions up front, the longer they'll stay with you. So when someone introduces you, embed some of these answers. Give them an agenda. People need to know where they're going and what the value is. But key is to get into the minds of your listeners and to meet them where they are and give them what they want in the way they need it. Now, when we talk about messaging, which is the third part of the YAM formula, too often I find people get into the weeds and the minutia and they're all over the place. What you need is laser-like focus. How do you do that? By being really clear and intentional of your outcome. Here's the best way to get to it. At the bottom, you'll see a sentence completion exercise. At the end of the presentation, the audience will blank. The answer to that is your outcome. Don't start with PowerPoint, start with this answer. And that will help you in your development so that you're, it's always leading you to your desired outcome. At the end of the presentation, the audience will learn five ways to close a sale. At the end of the presentation, the audience will agree to my proposal. Be crystal clear, because if you're not clear here, you're not going to get what you want. Just don't be like one of my audience members who said, at the end of the presentation, the audience will applaud. Well. That's very nice. That is not an outcome. But start with laser-like focus. And what I've included here is a template that will help you to stay on message and to be concise and to be organized. It starts with a purpose statement. Now, you can use this template for a short meeting update or a formal presentation. Another way of saying purpose statement is your hook. That's a grab or a headline that's going to get your audience involved. So for example, my hook today was speaking is the new competitive advantage. That was my hook. Now once you do that, the next step is to give them the agenda or roadmap because people need to know right away where you're taking them. So 
give them three points and let them know that this is where you're going to be going before you get into the details. Here's the mistake too many people make. They get stuck in the weeds because they lead with details. No, there should be a concise or clear opening, middle, and end. And save the meat for the, the middle. The details go in those points. So if you have three agenda items, now you delineate them once you get to the body. And then finally, you need a conclusion. I see people who end with their last point, and it's like a, a, dead, a, a lead balloon. Bring it back, and then what's the next step? You always want to be giving people next steps. One of the reasons meetings are not effective is because people are not clear in assigning those next steps, and then it falls through the cracks. So this is a good template to organize your thoughts. Now here's where we separate the novice from the seasoned presenter. I always know a new speaker because they sound choppy, there's a lack of transitions or segues. Now, why is this so important? Because the transitions are the thread that weave one idea into the next and creates that smooth flow and that polish. So here are a few. Let's begin with key findings and recommendations. Now that we've covered budget projections, let's take a look at benefits. The next area to consider is marketing. In addition to marketing, there's another area I'd like to discuss. A transition can be a sentence or it can be a question. And if you ever forget your transition, just say, here's where we've been and here's where we're going. Again, these are those fine finishing touches, that little thing that adds great impact. Now, you can be the greatest speaker in the world, but when Murphy's Law visits you, what do you do? How do you recover? And the key here is, to recover with grace. To me, the best poster child for recovery is the Olympic ice skater. Have you ever seen when they fall on the ice? What do they do? They get up and they carry on and they know they're not winning. And that's the mark of a true champion. So how do you develop recover, recovery strategies? The first thing is to anticipate them, plan for them. What is your worst nightmare? I had a person tell me, well, my worst nightmare is I'll trip. I'll trip over a wire. Okay, what if you did? What could you say? How about, I want you to know I've been practicing that entrance for weeks. Or, never let it be said that I don't know how to make an entrance. Practice and prepare ad-lib lines. These one-liners are going to help you if you get into trouble. So include it. In other words, if it's a little stumble, you mispronounced a word, you stuttered a little bit, forget it. Just keep going on. But if it's something major like you tripped, you dropped your papers, include it. Name the elephant in the room. Let the audience know you're not flustered, but you recognize what happened. And one of the best ways to deflect any tension is to use humor. I remember years ago, I was at the Ryman Theater in Nashville, and there were these two brothers. They had a duet. They were singing harmony. And in the middle of one of the numbers, one of the brothers cracked. He hit a bad note, and his voice cracked. And you know what that's like when you're in the audience. You're cringing. And when he finished his number, he stopped. He looked at the audience, and he said, I want to thank the audience for seeing me through puberty. Well, we all laughed hysterically. It was so funny. And he had even more respect for him as a result. So it's really important to be able to recover. Now, another technique is stay poised in the moment. One time I was on a panel and we were talking about media training. So I was asked a question. I was the first person to speak. This person next to me was an actual radio producer and host. And I guess he felt he knew more than I did. And he jumped in and started talking over me. And in a moment, I, I was really surprised by that. I thought it was rude. So what I did is I took back the floor and I underscored what he said and I made my points. When we finished the panel, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, I always respected you, Diane, but my respect went from A to Z when I saw that. So Again, it's not what ha happens, it's how you handle it. Another thing you can do is turn it back on the audience. When I was a adjunct 
lecturer at NYU, New York University, they asked the professors to come into a panel situation and describe their programs because they were recruiting for students. And at one point I had brain freeze and I just could not retrieve this word even though I knew what I wanted to say. So finally I said to the audience, what's the word I'm looking for? And someone gave it to me. No big deal. Recover. Have grace under pressure. So now, what's next? This is a very short period of time, and I can't tell you everything that I know. But here are ways that you can move forward from here. The key is to practice regularly. If you watch this and you do nothing, your skills will, Im will not improve. So how can you practice? Well, volunteer to speak if you don't have an opportunity. And if there's no opportunity at work, you can practice in local communities, churches, synagogues, schools, bookstores, any place. And teach others because the highest form of learning is teaching. So when you get off this webinar today, teach someone something you learned. You can also create job aids. Take a simple post-it. If you want to practice the pause, write the word pause and then put it on your laptop. Put it on your notes as a reminder. We all have smartphones. Record yourself. You can record audio or video, and you'll get a sense of how the audience is perceiving you. And then finally, develop an action plan. Commit to writing one goal that you want to achieve as a result of this webinar. One of the services I have is called the Influential Leader Action Plan. And what that is is you come to my office, and we spend 90 minutes together where we analyze and assess your current state uh, of our level of your speaking and then we write an action plan that you can implement or take it to the next level and finally I want to leave you with some free resources that will help your speaking and your presentation when you go to my website Duresta.com on the home page there is a free audio course it's called seven deadly mistakes speakers make and how to uh, avoid them from maximum success and you'll get them as a series of audio emails that is a free course for anybody on the call also to get a copy of knockout presentations which has been a category bestseller on Amazon go to knockoutpresentations.com or you can go directly to Amazon or even go into a Barnes and Noble store that has everything from soup to nuts and has been called the Bible of Public Speaking. I also have a blog. I have 109 or more YouTube videos on my channel, Diane Duresta. And then Facebook.com, Duresta Communications. I have a number of tips and techniques and information and videos that you can see there. So you can feel free to like my page and you'll have access to that. So I want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to open up the lines to questions or the chat box. So we're Hi going to everyone. take a moment. If you have, yes, if you have questions, please um, send me your questions through the question pane. Um, so, Diane, I have some questions already for you. Great. So the first question that I have is, before I speak publicly, I get very nervous and I imagine the worst. What can I do with this anxiety? I can tell you right now, you already have the key to your success. You said, I imagine the worst, imagine the best. And there are techniques where people can take you through that. I have a video on YouTube on affirmations. So if you look at youtube.com forward slash Diane DeResta, you will see something called affirmations and it's set to music and there are words and sentences that you can say over and over to program yourself. Use your app for meditation and calm yourself and get somebody who is a true believer who can help you with that to do the breathing exercises and to tell you what's good about it. Also, don't give the audience so much power. They are on your side. And remember this, you are a VIP. You're a very important person because you have information they want. If you didn't, you would not be speaking. So accept the butterflies as adrenaline and say, you're, reframe it. This is adrenaline. This is good. It's going to make me a more effective speaker and to be more dynamic. And again, I have so many tips in chapters of my book. I think it's chapter three on fear fixes. Great. The next question is, how can I deal with my feelings that everyone is staring and judging me when I speak in front of an audience? 
All right, again, this is a common feeling and realize everybody that fear begins in the mind. So when I work with people, we work both on mindset and skill set, but you need to change that. People are not hostile to you. Yes, th there is a time when you have to encounter a hostile audience and that's a whole different talk. But most of the time, people want to hear your information. So it's again, being friends with people, get there early and greet people because you'll feel like you have friends and have some offline conversations and then when you can bring in something that you learned reference someone call someone's name people love when you mention their names another thing that you can do is to think about you know who is in your audience and simply send out positive energy to them in other words make them your friends they are on your side and get some confirmation from people that you trust who can give you that confidence building that you need memorize your opening line that's another tip people get scared because they don't know how to begin memorize your opening line take a deep breath say it pause and then move on Great. So the next question is, um, what are the best practices for the amount of text and headings on PowerPoint presentations? All right. You know, this keeps changing, but ideally, I would say 36 points for the title, 32 points for the bullets, make it large enough to project in most venues. But there used to be a six by six rule, which meant no more than six words on a line, no more than six lines on a slide. That's become old school. Now it's more about photographs, visuals, keywords. So think images. Now the challenge most of you will have is if you're working for a corporation, they're not going for that. So try the six by six rule. Fewer, less text, more graphs, charts, visuals. Great. So the next question is, I have a lot of troubles when I project my voice and it hurts when I raise the volume. So what can I do to make sure that people can hear me and I'm presenting with confidence? One of the reasons your voice may hurt is you're talking from your vocal folds or your throat instead of your diaphragm. And so I would say work with a voice coach or take an, an acting class where they will work on voice because the best presenters from the stage and the best singers have mastered abdominal breathing so that they can project their voice in a large venue. The other thing I would say is if you have the opportunity, if you, you can get a type of portable microphone to amplify your voice so that you're not straining it. You might ask for a lavalier mic, even if it's a small group, until that time when you have developed that abdominal breathing. The other thing I would say too, I'm putting my speech pathologist hat on, if you're feeling pain, I would go to a speech pathologist and get a vocal checkup and make sure that there's nothing that's getting in the way because it shouldn't hurt when you're projecting your voice. The next question I have is, what would you say is a good balance in percentages between anecdotes, facts, and processes when presenting? Hmm. I think it depends on the topic and it depends on the, the audience. So, for example, if you were talking to a sales group, you want a lot more entertainment, more stories, more anecdotes, and a few facts. If you're talking to engineers, you need to be very heavy on the data and details with some stories and anecdotes woven in. So I can't give you an actual percentage because it's really going to depend on the audience. I will say though, if you want to be more entertaining, if you want to ha have people have an experience, you want to use more stories and anecdotes. I don't think you can go wrong with stories, but if it's a corporate setting or if it's a more technical audience, your your stories might want to be more case studies than motivational, life-changing stories, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's going to depend on your audience. 
how do you find and develop opportunities to speak about topics that are important to you? How do, could you repeat that? How do you find and develop opportunities to speak about topics that are important to you? I don't know if the question is coming from someone who wants to be a speaker or if it's someone in a company. Usually if you're in a company, you're speaking because you have meetings. You, it, let's say you're in a company. You can volunteer. You can ask your manager for opportunities to speak, and uh, whether it's externally or whether it's in, in the company. So first ask for those opportunities. If it's not that situation and you're looking to go out on your own, how do you find those opportunities? Well, let me invite you on February 19th, I'm going to be speaking at Morning Mojo, which is a, a networking group. And I'm going to be talking about Speak to Sell, how to speak to build your business. So if, if the question is from someone who wants to use speaking in that capacity, send me a, a text, a, sorry, a message, and I can tell you where that will be. But it's February 19th, 8.30 to 10 in the morning, New York time. And aside from that, start locally. Go to your public library. Go to a church or synagogue. Go to a school. Go to a rotary club. Ask other people who are speaking where they're going, especially your industry association start with your local chapters so if you're an engineer what's the engineering association if you're a lawyer maybe you're going to talk to the bar association but ask around ask for references so the next question is how do you feel about using our personal notes in front of the audience as long as notes are not a distraction I don't say that you can't use notes. Some people do it very effectively. So, for example, if you're at a lectern, it's a lot easier because you can move the notes easily and they're just there. I would say if you are using notes, make sure that it, the print is large enough so that you don't have to read. When you have notes, reference them but don't read them. So sometimes people will be standing at a table, let's say. Let's say it's a meeting and you're standing up at the meeting table in a conference room and you have your notes on the table that's fine occasionally glance down to see where you are but if you're holding them in your hands and you're reading word for word that's not effective so take the script and now convert it to bullet points build in stories build in little cases or case studies create an anecdote or an analogy and have a discussion. The more you can connect with your audience, the more that you can be conversational, the more effective you're going to be. Fantastic. So it seems like we have a few more minutes for just a couple more questions. So please feel free to send them in the question pane. But I have um, two quick questions for mm -hmm. you that I've gotten. So the first one is, what is the citation of the UCLA communication study that you mentioned in your presentation? It was uh, Professor Albert Marabian, M-A-H-R-A-B-I-A-N. I believe that is the reference. It is an old study. I believe it's from the 1970s. Uh, it's gotten criticism. That's why I said don't take it literally, because certainly your words is, are a lot more important than 7%. But I think it does speak well to the idea of the importance of congruency. And then can you just explain the difference between vocal and verbal again? Mm -hmm. Vocal is tone and verbal are the words. So, for example, if I say, I'm not angry, what makes you think I'm angry? Well, the message was in the tone. And if you believe the words, you're going to have a miscommunication. So the meta message is the tone and tone will supersede the words. And that's where sometimes people have difficulty and that's a piece of emotional intelligence when you can tune in to what's really being said and not literally always believing the words. So tonality is important. And so if you're trying to convince someone and you have low affect, you're going to wonder why aren't they on board? I, I presented all the facts, the science is there, the data is there. Yeah, but you don't sound excited. So tone is really important. 
Fantastic. I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, and it looks like we just hit that hour mark. But if you have any questions, please feel free to um, reach out to Diane through her website, Daresta.com. And Diane, I want to take the time to thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with the TC community. Everyone, a video of this presentation will be available on our website, which is again, www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. Please visit our website for more information about our monthly webinars and our upcoming events. We hope you can join us for our next webinar, which is called Creating a Climate for the Growth Mindset to Flourish, which will happen on March 13th with alumna Courtney Brown. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.